Open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the back there. You're welcome to take one, and I encourage you to have a Bible with you on Sunday here because we, we just walk through passages of Scripture. We examine it together as a church, and the goal is not so much for me to give you a message as it is for us to together examine a particular passage to make it our own, to study it and absorb the truth of it. Uh, before I, I read the text this morning, I, I had a, something of an impression um, as we were praying and pre-meeting prayer for the, the church this morning, and I, I just want to ask you to join me to do something. I was, I was burdened in thinking about the children that are back in the classes, just went back there, a number of your children are there, um, and I want to just take a moment and pray for God's anointing on the teachers, and that God would use the lessons this morning to uh, bring gospel truth and even salvation uh, into the hearts of, of those young people. So would you just, just join me? Let's just, and if you're, if you're with a, a spouse or family member, let's just kind of join hands together and let's just agree together um, that the Lord would do that. Lord, I, I'm just burdened by these young children that are back in those classes right now. Lord, I, we lift them up to you. Lord, they are a future generation and we want to see your gospel go to the next generation. And so I pray that you would anoint those teaching today, that their lessons, even with all the child-directed creativity, would be filled with anointing by your Spirit. Lord, that you would penetrate young hearts, that appropriate conviction of sin and the comfort of the gospel would overwhelm even the youngest back there, Lord. We pray for conversions in our children's ministry classes on Sunday mornings. We pray that parents would experience a barrage of questions on the way home about you and about heaven and about Jesus. We lift up every child there and we pray for their conversion. I thank you also, Lord, for the young ones who are are sitting here for this message. I pray your blessing on them. I pray you give them ears to hear as well. Thank you for them, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of transferring your gospel to the next generation. May they receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's read together. We are coming into the third part of this story about the lame beggar that was healed when Peter and John went to the temple. It's actually a, a fairly extensive story that Luke chose to put in his book of Acts. It's all of chapter 3, almost all of chapter 4 is the aftermath of it. So if you think of the, even the length of the book, this story about the lame man and the resulting proclamation and then the reaction of the leaders is, is a significant uh, moment for Luke as he writes the book. He, he sees something in this story that is an example of how the gospel goes forward consistently. He sees this in some ways as a prototype for the rest of the book. So it's, it's helpful for, for us to see out of a 28 chapter book, two whole chapters are devoted to this particular story. Helpful to, to remember. So we're going to read chapter 4, uh, not all of it, but verses 1 through 22. Uh, uh, this morning. Let's read it together, and then we'll jump in and study it for our benefit this morning. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. As they, that's Peter and John, as they were speaking to the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, 
Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. I've been watching the NBA Finals recently. I enjoy, when I can, watching a game of basketball. And um, I've enjoyed tracking the career of, of one player who's playing in the Finals named Stephen Curry. Um, I remember watching him when he was in college. Um, and he, he was a unlikely basketball player, very slight, uh, especially in college. He had a, a serious baby face, a uh, very small looking guy out there with all these large muscular men. Um, he looked like the boy amongst the men in college, but in one of the years of his career, they had this marvelous run in the college tournament. Uh, it, he played for a college <laughs> named Davidson, aptly named um, given their size. Um, but it was a David and Goliath moment for this college team. They were this small team. They had this small star, small of stature, but they just won over and over again in the tournament, upset after upset, made this incredible run. And so this is really exciting. It's what every basketball fan lives for, that kind of surprising David and Goliath story. What was surprising about it was the irony when you looked at this little guy with his childish face and slight frame, you thought, Man, there's nothing powerful about him. And then you watched them play. And again and again, the game would end, and somehow their team was on top. Despite all the appearances, they and their apparent weakness would overcome the apparent strengths of everyone opposing them. That's true of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's a major theme in the book of Acts. There's a, a major note of irony in Luke's writing. He, he inserts it again and again. Despite the apparent power of those opposing the gospel and the exaltation of Jesus as the Savior and Messiah, the ultimate victory goes again and again and again to the advancing gospel. Again and again, the appearances in the book of Acts are that this weak, unimpressive, slight of frame, or I need to use the words of the passage, uneducated and common uh, in its witnesses, this message again and again sees the victory over the apparent power and apparent strength of the opposition. And this story kind of launches that theme that's going to happen again and again in the book of Acts. It's meant to encourage us to uh, get us cheering if I can kind of picture us as people that are watching the first century church from the sidelines, this 
in passage and many others in Acts, they're, they're meant to get us cheering. Look at what happened again, again. Again, this ironic reversal takes place. The unimpressively represented gospel overcomes that which has apparent power. So it's, it's worth asking a question of ourselves this morning. How powerful do we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ to be? How powerful? Because it doesn't always appear powerful to us. It sometimes seems commonplace or familiar, maybe historical, perhaps comforting, but, but not always powerful. But Acts is a book about power, and that power is contained in the exaltation of Jesus Christ through the proclamation of his gospel. Christ will be exalted as Savior, Luke says, through his witnesses in the face of determined opposition. In spite of opposition, Christ will be exalted as Savior. His gospel will advance. That's the message that Luke gives to us again and again. Christ will be exalted in spite of overwhelming opposition. In, in spite of the apparent strength of the opposition, the name of Jesus will be exalted and his gospel will advance. And as the inheritors of this tradition, Luke wants to get us cheering. He wants to get us excited because the same gospel that Peter preaches, we preach. The same gospel that he proclaims, we proclaim. As the old Puritan said, it may be that there's, there's those that can preach, a better, uh, uh, preach better the gospel, but they cannot preach a better gospel. That's true of Peter. He may be able to preach better than we can. He may be able to proclaim better than we can, but he cannot proclaim a better gospel. It's the same gospel that he proclaims. And according to Luke, this gospel, though apparently weak, actually has overcoming power in spite of the opposition. Let's walk through the, the three movements of this story. There's three movements, and then I want to ask some questions of us in application. Three movements. First of all, the resistance. You notice this in verses 1 through 4, the resistance. As they're speaking, so Peter and John are teaching. Apparently, right next to them is this man that's been lame for 40 years. He's now standing, leaping, and, and they're preaching uh, about Jesus Christ. He's declared to be the Messiah in Peter's sermon. And as they're doing this, the priests and the captain of the temple... And the Sadducees come upon them. The Sadducees were the ruling aristocracy. Most of the priests would have come from the Sadducees. They did not believe in any resurrection. Uh, they were friendly, we might say, with Rome. They were politically savvy, and they had positions of power in the priesthood. This is the Sadducees, as the priests came, and then the captain of the temple responsible for order in the temple. And it says in verse 2, they're greatly annoyed because they, Peter and John, were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Their annoyance probably focused on two points. First of all, we don't believe there is a res resurrection from the dead, as Sadducees, but perhaps more dangerous than that, you're saying that this resurrection takes place in Jesus Christ, that he was resurrected and that there's a resurrection in him. So the focus of their annoyance, their frustration, is you're contradicting what we teach the people. It's our role to teach the people, and you're contradicting us not only in the idea of a resurrection, but especially focusing on this person named Jesus. And essentially, this is a, how dare you, who do you think you are, and why are you standing in our temple proclaiming these things? We are the caretakers of God's teaching. We are the caretakers of God's people. You may not. So they're greatly annoyed, and they arrested them, it says. Quite a dramatic scene if you think about it. They're standing on this portico. Peter's proclaiming the Messiah whom your rulers crucified. And all of a sudden, here comes traipsing in the... Imagine if this happened right now. Imagine, here, here comes the temple guard and all the leaders and the priests, the religious rulers. They come in and they, they drag these men off, greatly annoyed. And the crowd's left standing there wondering what's going to happen. But even in this opening paragraph, Luke's use of irony makes a point very clear. Did you, did you notice that irony? No, notice that. The Bible uses irony all the time. What apparently is going to happen is the opposite of what does happen. And in that irony, it makes the point. That irony is the point. 
They arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. So, so you stop the end of verse 3, and all the appearances are this movement has stopped before it began. They're arrested. They're imprisoned. They're in chains. They're being opposed by all of the rulers, the religious rulers of the people. You don't notice the three groups of people come and drag Peter and John, put them in prison. They're in prison overnight. It's as though night falls on the early church. And then Luke inserts verse 4. But, but, Many of those who had heard the word believed. How many, Luke? The number of the men came to about 5,000. Notice how Luke's using irony to make his point. Well, sure, they arrested Peter and John. Whoa, terrible, awful. That seems like that's the end of it, right? No, actually, thousands of people were converted that day. Thousands of people were converted that day. So yeah, they're in prison, apparently weak, apparently helpless, but actually through their word of proclamation, the church just grew by thousands of people. What's the point that irony puts forward? Christ will be exalted as Savior in spite of determined opposition. In spite of determined opposition, in spite of the apparent strength and power of the opposition, in the end... Christ is exalted as Savior because thousands of people believe. The resistance actually reveals the power of the revival. All these points are going to just show the irony of this. What does the resistance do? Nothing. It does nothing. The apparent power is helpless. Peter and John are arrested, but the gospel is not. Peter and John are imprisoned, but the gospel is not. Peter and John are put away overnight, but the gospel is not. Resistance, verses 1 through 4. Second section, the trial. The trial also has significant irony. It says in verse 5, On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. Now, we want to pay close attention to these names. Pay close attention because if you've, if you've read your Bible, if you've been a Christian any length of time, these will sound very familiar, and they're supposed to. Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who are of the high priestly family. The setting should seem familiar as well. They set them in the midst, and they inquired, by what power, by what name did you do this? Luke is very intentionally drawing an almost exact comparison with the trial of Jesus. It's the same people. Remember, it's, it's only been a matter of weeks, maybe months at most, since Jesus was literally in the same exact position, facing these same exact people, surrounded by the Sanhedrin, determined to crush him and his movement in Jerusalem. So here you have, the, remember, Peter was there. So you have to feel the drama of this moment. Peter is now standing in the very place his Lord was standing when he was condemned to death. He's standing. He was right outside, remember, when he went to the high priest's house and he refused to confess Jesus. I don't know the man, said Peter. Now Peter is standing in the Sanhedrin. He's surrounded by the very accusers of Jesus Christ who sent him to his death on a Roman cross and they're being challenged who and by whom did you do this? So the crucified one is now the name that Peter has to bring up to the people who crucified him. Do you feel the irony of this? Feel the helplessness of this for Peter. Feel the apparent weakness. What's the worst possible name that you could reference to Caiaphas and Annas and the high priestly family and the Sanhedrin? What's the worst possible name? Well, how about the one they called a blasphemer and sent to a Roman cross? Is there any worse name that they could submit to these people? It would appear that death will be the outcome. Why would Peter have any other expectation but that he will die after declaring Jesus Christ to be the source of the lame man's healing? But notice the change that has come upon Peter in verse 8. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. It is one of the great redemptions of the Bible, what happens to Peter in the book of Acts. And it's meant to encourage all of us. 
not just a slave girl asking, do you know the man? By what name? Full Sanhedrin, high priestly. By what name do you do this thing? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what he does? Brilliant writing by Luke, inspired by the Spirit. He turns the trial upside down immediately. Suddenly, suddenly, notice how he does this. Suddenly, it's not Peter and John that are on trial, but it's the entire Sanhedrin. Notice how he does this. He says, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man. Now, before he even, <laughs> that's just his intro statement. He, it, th think about this. He's saying, Let, let's be clear. So you're putting us on trial for raising up a crippled man. Are we clear on that? You're arresting us for raising up a man who begged at your temple gate for 40 years. Let's set the context. That's why we're on trial. Immediately, and immediately the irony begins to play. Who's really on trial here? Who? Who's being examined? The guys that helped the poor lame man walk and leap again. So why are they on trial? Exactly. The trial is immediately reversed. If, 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 if we are being examined today concerning a good deed, and we are being clearly uh, done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? And then the irony continues. Let it be known to all of you, and notice the boldness of Peter, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Unafraid. Suddenly, Suddenly, who's on trial? The same power that raised up this lame man is the man you crucified. Ironic, isn't it? The one who saves the lame man, and I can't go into it, but the language of, that he, Peter uses in referencing the saving of the lame man is intentional. It, it hints that this is in seed form a representation of a broader salvation. Peter is trying to make the point. He, he just make him better. That this is an indication of the power that Jesus has more pervasively, more holistically. He's a savior is the point Jesus is making. If we're asking, if you're asking us, you're examining us on a good deed done to a lame man, by what means this man has been healed? I'll tell you who was healed, who it was that healed him. It was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the despised one of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised him from the dead. There again, we're presented again in spite of your rejection. God is revealing him to be who he really is, the exalted Savior and Lord. By him, by him, by Jesus, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. This man is standing before you. Then, you got to feel the irony. If we don't get used to ironing the Bible, we will miss a lot of the, the, the poignancy of the points. Listen to this. Peter goes exegetical <laughs> to the teachers of Israel. He's teaching the teachers. So he quotes the Psalms. This, he says, this Jesus is the stone, quote from the Old Testament, is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, that has become the cornerstone. He's quoting the Psalms. In the Psalms, it said there was a stone. In that immediate context, it would have referenced a king called of God that the builders of the people rejected when they should have chosen and exalted him. And Peter says the ultimate fulfillment of that is in Jesus because he's the great, he's God's chosen cornerstone and you rejected him. But the reality is there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. So I titled this section trial verses five through 12 and it's, it's an ironic word because who's on trial now? I mean, Peter's surrounded by the Sanhedrin, but who's on trial now? Anybody that rejected Jesus is on trial. Anybody that rejected, I mean, the, the, the fisherman with no educational background, with no lettered studies, is able to stand there and declare, you are the ones who have missed God's purposes. You are the ones who have rejected the cornerstone. The image is of this, this beautiful stone that is put first to establish the direction of the whole building. And, and Peter's saying God had this perfect cornerstone to establish the direction of the whole building. And you're the ones that are supposed to see what God is doing. 
But instead of seeing and exulting in that perfect cornerstone, you cast it aside as if it was worthless, as if it was nothing. God's very perfect cornerstone for the building of his new temple, you threw aside as though it was worthless. Worse than that, you rejected him as a blasphemer. And here's the most crushing verdict of all. There is salvation in no one else. Amen. It, it's, it, Peter's, it's brilliant inspiration of the Spirit. It's good news and horrific news. Simultaneously, there is salvation in no one else. The one you crucified is the only Savior that God has given the one you rejected is the only cornerstone. The temple that will be is built on Jesus. There is no other temple. There is no other way for anyone to be saved. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Remember, he's saying this to the priests. He's saying this to the men responsible for representing people to God and God to people for providing the atonement of people who are sinners to a holy God. And he's saying, there is only one salvation to God and it is not you and it is no longer the work you do in this temple. It is is Jesus Christ. And we know, because we know the rest of the New Testament, that these marvelous two truths go together. Because Jesus was crucified, he is the cornerstone of the new temple. Because he was crucified for sinners, he is the name under which sinners may be saved. And so we see the, the beauty of the gospel packed here into this wonderful sermon that, that Luke records for us. He's saying, look, remember, Christians, you should be cheering the wisdom of God. The one the builders rejected became the cornerstone because they rejected him. The one who was crucified became the only salvation because he was crucified. And you, you hear the Christians through the centuries reading this story of the early church and the wisdom of God and, and cheering and standing up and saying, how wise is God that he can use the very rejection of Christ to establish him as an atoning savior for sinners. How wise is the wisdom of God better than the foolishness of man, better than the wisdom of this world because God can use Jesus and his rejection to save those who rejected him. Who's on trial? The world. Who's the only rescue from that trial? Jesus. Amen. Ironic. Beautifully ironic. Wisdom of heaven. If we could paint the, the, the heavenly picture... It appears as though Peter and John in their measly little fishing garb standing before all these impressively arrayed priests appear to be on trial. But like Elijah, it's as though God unveils and heaven itself stands behind them. And God himself in the person of the Son stands behind them and suddenly we see the real trial going on and there's this great heavenly witness watching and there's only one spokesman in this room preaching for God. And this one standing there with, with Jesus Christ standing behind him and his spirit filling him proclaims the truth of God and says, there is only one salvation. There is only one cornerstone and Jesus Christ will be exalted. And I don't care what you do with me, but I'm representing the exalted Savior and all of you must believe in him if you would be saved. Incredible reversal in this moment. There is salvation in no one else, Peter says. Third scene, the dilemma. Also ironic, the dilemma. In verse 13, it says that the leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men. So notice, that, notice the contradiction. That's the point. They're bold. They have no education. They're common men. And they're astonished. How can common, uneducated men be bold? There's only one explanation. They've been with Jesus. Because that's what Jesus was like, uneducated, and yet more bold than anyone would have imagined. The only explanation is Jesus. And that's true for the church in every age. There should be only one explanation for our boldness, and that should be Jesus Christ. We don't boast in any education we do have, 
And we certainly don't fear any education we don't have or any social standing or any governmental prominence or any political clout because ultimately, ultimately, the only reason we're able to be who we're called to be witnesses in this world is because they, we have been with Jesus. So they're in a a dilemma. It's good to enjoy the humor of the Bible. I mean, Acts has so many humorous... You have the most impressive religious elite in the country connected to Rome, the most powerful ruling force of history at that time, and they don't know what to do. They're stymied because the guy who used to be lame is not lame anymore. And everybody knows, you almost feel their sense of like, well, we, if we only we could have <laughs> hushed him up, then nobody would know that. But everybody knows it. Notice down there, uh, it says, we, in verse 16, we cannot deny it. You feel this, this frustrated argument. Oh, man. <laughs> We, we'll really look bad if we say, well, he's, he's not really walking. We can't say that. We can't, we can't do anything. We're stuck, guys. Now we got a problem because we have visible evidence of supernatural power right here. And then over here, we have these guys claiming in Jesus. What are we going to do? We're either going to look like absolute idiots or Jesus is going to be exalted. Yep, that's basically the way history is going to turn out too. So they called them, they say, here's what we'll do. We'll bank on their fear. We'll bank on their fear. Can't actually deny the healing. We don't want Jesus exalted. We'll bank on their fear. We'll threaten them. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Or what? Peter and John were not in their deliberations. So for Peter and John, they don't know about this dilemma. (coughs) Or what? Peter knew Jesus was awfully popular with the people too. Who's to say? They won't just drag him out and incite the crowd against them. That will happen in the future in the book of Acts. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Notice who has the dilemma and who doesn't. They're trying to create a dilemma for Peter and John and saying, look, you have a choice here. You can follow Jesus or you can be afraid of us. Peter says, you're the one with the real dilemma. Do you really claim that we should follow you rather than God? You as the apparent representatives of God? Clearly God has done something in the lame man. So are you really saying that we should reject what God is doing and what God has done in Jesus in order to follow you? Who has the dilemma? The Sanhedrin has the dilemma. We can't punish them because it's so evident God is with them. Now this passage is not claiming that every time the church faces a trial, there won't be any punishment or that every time God will produce a healing to defend the church. I mean, this, this story is designed to make a point and that is that, that ultimately one way in a given generation, given story, another way in a different generation, different story, different times and different measures, different times even in the book of Acts. But in this story, the way God chose to preserve the gospel and to exalt Jesus was by creating this dilemma for the Sanhedrin. We can't deny the healing, but we don't want them to preach in Jesus' name. We'll threaten and warn them. But Jesus, uh, Je- uh, Peter says, absolutely not. So in this scenario, it's the courage of the witnesses of Jesus that God uses to exalt the Savior. God uses the courage of Peter and John to exalt the Savior, to show that his gospel is unstoppable. The commentator Eckhard Schnabel says this, they cannot allow themselves to be silenced as a result of a gag order issued by human beings when the exalted Jesus, who sits on David's eternal throne at God's right hand, has bestowed on them God's spirit in whose power they speak and teach. What a marvelous description of what's going on here. Let's read that again. They cannot allow themselves to be silenced as a result of a gag order, listen, issued by human beings 
When the exalted Jesus, who sits on David's eternal throne at God's right hand, has bestowed on them God's spirit in whose power they speak and teach. So they say, no, no, we will keep teaching. We're not even going to pretend like we might answer. You ever do that sometimes where somebody says, hey, can you, can you come um, to my birthday party? Boy, we'll see. Have you ever done that before? I've done that before. Boy, I'll look at it. It's, you know you're not going to go, but it's hard to say that in the moment. And so you kind of say, we'll look at it. And it's like consolation. We'll see, you know. Or maybe somebody says, hey, can you come help me move my couch? Ah, I'll see what I'm doing that day. You know, it's like a consolation moment. Peter could have said, you know, we'll think about it. <laughs> you know, let's get out of here. This is not a safe place to be. But, but he just says right then and there, does not give in to that kind of fear of man, not evasive. No, 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 no. No, I know right now, we will not do that. We will, we must keep proclaiming Jesus. There is salvation in no one else. God has sent him as exalted Savior and Lord. How do we have any choice but to declare and proclaim him to be who he is? Absolutely not. And so the irony continues. When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. What's the point? In this moment, God exalts the gospel by <laughs> binding the very people who would oppose it. He exalts the gospel by binding and rendering helpless the people who appear to have the most power. He gives freedom to the people who appear weak, and he gives power power to the people who appear, appear helpless, and he gives weakness to the people who appear strong. He reverses the whole order. What appears to be the case is reversed. David Peterson says this, there is distinct irony in this section. The authorities have the power to punish the apostles, but they are afraid to use it because public opinion is against them. Peter and John have no political power, but demonstrate a God-given courage that is compelling in conjunction with the evidence of the healing miracle. They appear as true leaders of the people, bearing witness to what they have seen and heard, despite the consequences for them personally. Jesus Christ will be exalted as Savior and Lord, despite opposition. There is no opposition that can stop the unstoppable gospel about Jesus. Appearances are reversed when we see things through heavenly perspective. Appearances are reversed when we see things through heavenly perspective. The weak church is actually strong. The powerless preacher is actually powerful. The Christian with apparently no background and no standing is actually the most powerful person in the room because they contain the gospel of the exalted Savior and Lord. Jesus will be exalted through the courage of his witnesses despite intense opposition. That's true eternally. That's, that's why we read the Bible as having perpetual, perennial relevance to us today. That's true right now today. Right now today, it is true that this same message about the exaltation of Jesus as the new temple, as the exalted Messiah and Savior, cannot be stopped despite the apparent opposition of those who would oppose him. The church must receive the lesson of the early church and apply it. We must not see only with our eyes, but with our faith, believe in the power of the unstoppable gospel. We must not be overawed or impressed by human structures of power and prominence more than being impressed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must see in Jesus the exaltation of God's only Savior and declare him to be the only unstoppable force in this universe. It's good news for the church because the church is often fearful and worried 
and desirous of maintaining our comfort and our reputation and our social status and our political standing. But God says those things are irrelevant to the eternal power of the gospel. Look at Peter and John. <laughs> they have nothing but the gospel. But the gospel had more power than every political figure in that room and all the apparent strength they had to bind and resist them. Three questions I want to ask for our own application of this truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. First of all, are we hungry for a revival even if it means our own suffering? Are we hungry for a revival even if it means our own suffering? Let me encourage you, ask your soul an honest question. If you're Peter and John and you know going into that day that the trade will be arrest, the loss of your freedom, or the salvation of these people in the temple, which would we choose? Let's be honest with ourselves. And let's be honest also that it's the little moments in our life right now that reveal how we think about the big moments if they ever come. Let's ask right now, is there any suffering that I'd like to avoid that is more important to me than seeing Jesus exalted as Savior? Whether it's revival in the church, whether it's revival of evangelism as it was in this case, is there any suffering I'd rather avoid than see Jesus exalted as Savior, as strong in the midst of weakness? Paul was able to learn this lesson so well, he said, I boast in my weaknesses because I've come to see that it's then that the power of God is displayed through me. When I'm weak, then I'm strong, he said. I think he learned this lesson of Peter and John. He said, look, look, I, I'm, I'm not afraid of weaknesses anymore. I'm not afraid of suffering anymore. I'm not afraid of being made vulnerable anymore and being shown to be limited anymore because those are the moments, it would seem, that God most frequently displays the power of his gospel. I, I've known Christians, and I certainly can wear this in my own life, where there's just certain types of suffering that we're afraid of. Lord, anything but that. Anything but that, Lord. Sometimes it's physical challenges or the loss of family or health or in this case, the loss of freedom. Unpopularity. And we say anything but that, Lord. It, it's good for the church to resolve in our hearts, Lord, I'd rather your name be exalted even if I'm taken away or my comfort is taken away or my position is taken away or I lose the freedom I hold so dear. Lord, even if you were to choose to take that away for the sake of revealing your gospel and so that I could be used in the proclamation of your name, Lord, Lord, there is no suffering that I'd rather avoid than see your name exalted. Second question. Are we prepared to bear witness in the face of opposition? Are we prepared for that? Are we prepared to bear witness in the face of opposition? Certainly this is true in evangelism because there's the opposition of a neighbor that thinks you're strange after you start talking about God and the gospel and church with them. There's the danger of opposition in our family when we stand for truth the way Peter and John did. There's the danger of opposition in our culture when we stand for our biblical convictions and instead of giving in and surrendering to the convictions of the culture. There's so many examples where we need to be prepared to bear witness. And the reason we do that is not merely out of duty. It's not merely because that's the right thing to do. It's because we believe in the end, God's gospel cherished and valued and proclaimed by his church has power to exalt Jesus Christ in spite of any opposition. We believe that. And believing that nourishes our souls and declares, what am I first of all? And what are you first of all? Before anything else, I am in Christ Jesus. 
before anything else, before I'm a parent, before I'm a husband, before I'm a child, before I'm a member of this community, I am in Christ Jesus. And that identity is worth facing any opposition if I can proclaim it and declare it and live it, whatever that means in a given situation. Let's let our identity as Jesus' witnesses proclaiming him prepare us to bear witness to any kind of opposition. Fathers are called to bear witness in their homes despite the opposition of children who don't want to talk about Jesus. Mothers are called to bear witness to the gospel even when their husband is not wanting to hear about it and is frustrated at them for representing Jesus and his calling uh, in our lives. Parents are called to bear witness to children even when they're bored and angry and frustrated. Friends are called to bear witness to friends even when that interrupts the smooth camaraderie of experience at that point. We're called to stand up and declare Jesus Christ's exaltation as Savior and Lord is the reason I'm on this earth. Third question. Are we confident that no visible power is stronger than the advancing gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the point of this passage. Jesus will be exalted as Savior through the courage of his witnesses in spite of any opposition. Are we confident? Brothers and sisters, are we confident of that? No visible power is stronger than the advancing gospel of Jesus Christ? No visible power? Not political chaos in Europe? Not moral depravity here at home? Not the challenge of diabolical religions around the world? No visible power is stronger than the advancing gospel of Jesus Christ? Not internal failures in the church? Not breakdown in church leadership? Not division in various aspects of the body of Christ? No visible power is stronger than the gospel of Jesus Christ? Not the rejection of biblical values in our community? Not the rejection of convictions about family life and gender and godliness and, and holiness? No visible power is stronger than the advancing gospel of Jesus Christ. Not Hollywood, not Wall Street, not grassroots movements, not political leaders, not foreign political leaders. Nothing is stronger than the advancing gospel of the one Savior for humanity. And you and I as Christians enjoy that gospel every day. We enjoy and sing about the salvation that's available only in Jesus Christ. So let's be confident. Let's live out that confidence. There is no visible power stronger than the advancing gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for including us on this mission. Lord, in our own hearts and in our community and in our families, to stand for your exaltation as Savior and Lord with our words, with our lives, reflecting it in our character, Lord, that everything we are would be about exalting the name of Jesus. Lord, and we, we claim the truth of this passage as our belief. We believe our only salvation is found in you. We, we reject all self-righteousness, and declare that you alone are the cornerstone. A dwelling with God is available only through you. Lord, we reject the fear that clings so closely for the proclamation of your word, Lord, in our homes, Lord, in our friendships, in our communities. Make our lives shaped by the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray, fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name.